Amen. All right. Let's go ahead and open up to Genesis 39. We're just going to run through a bunch of scriptures, okay? Because we're going to show you, we're going to show you some things here. And uh, there, is a, there is, and there always will be. Everybody say, there is, and there always will be. A connection between receiving from God and what His Word says to do about it. You will find over and over and over again a connection between being obedient to a command of God and receiving something from God. New Testament, Old Testament, ministry of Jesus Testament. I mean, it's, it's just throughout the Bible. Hello? Listen to someone preach recently on television. They were talking about, you know, the parable of the Lamb. You know, that Jesus left the 99, went and got the one, and, you know, and, uh, you know basically he said that the Lamb, he's trying to teach the, the repentance. The Lamb repented. How did he repent? He didn't do anything. Jesus picked it up and carried him. That's how repentance works. And I said, you know, you're taking an allegory and you're over, you, you took the wrong path of that. The allegory was about that Jesus went and sought out the lost. Right. Had nothing to do with it. The lamb didn't repent. Okay? So, that, so understand that, you know, there is going to be requirements on your behalf for anything that you do and get from heaven. Praise God. Amen. All right, Genesis chapter 39. It's in your Bible. Actually, it's the first book chrono I mean, um, uh, in, in, in our English Bibles, it's the first book. How many you know what the oldest book of the Bible is? Job. Or if you just don't know your Bible real good, the book of Job. Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, bought, uh, bought him of the hands of the Ishmaelites, which had brought him hit, down hither, or thither. And the Lord was with Joseph, and he was prosper, a prosperous man, and he, was, uh, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And the, his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. Now what? All that he what? See, there is an action. Is that not an action? Amen. The Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, but then they, see, note, they took note. See, if you just jump in there and take that out, oh, the Lord, he, the Lord was with him, he prospered, he just prospered. But then they took note. So you've got to read everything in context. We can't, I, I, told, I told the kids that, because we were watching this particular uh, preacher on television, and, and I said, and, and I don't know if Jesse was in the room, she had left, but Shannon was there. I said, ministers have a responsibility to do a thorough exegesis of what they're teaching so that they don't teach their little pet peeve and just pull this out and pull that out and, and, and build everything around what they want it to be built around instead of letting the Word of God do its own commentary. Because yeah. the Word of God, if you let the Word of God do its own commentary, there's going to be times you come up and it's going to tell you something you don't want to hear. Yeah. Hello? And let's face it, nobody wants to believe. No, listen, we, we, we spent so much time in the word of faith circles trying to prove that God was good and only good that we couldn't deal with judgment in the church. Uh-huh, that won't ever be. I don't believe in judgment. Well, check out Anna, Annie and Sapphira. Hello? They were, they were part of the church, but they went out and did something, brought it in and tried to deceive the church. And, uh, and Peter says, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? And they fell dead. Yeah. <laughs> Woo! Nobody wants to preach on that. Let me tell you something. I was sitting in a service in 19... Um, uh, actually, it was Brother Summer I was, doing, was teaching at Raymond in 1980, 81 school year. So that the fall of 88, and I don't remember when Brother Summerall came. I'm trying to remember what time. I can't remember if he came in the fall or the spring. I don't remember at this time. But Brother Summerall was there, and he, he, he got talking about Ananias and Sapphira. He said the days of Ananias and Sapphira will return to the church before Jesus comes back. Yeah. <laughs> Why? Because judgment begins at the house of God first. God's got to clean his church up before he can clean the world up. And I'm going to tell you one reason the world's getting worse and worse is because the church has gotten lazy and gotten lethargic and gotten out of, gotten out of place and gotten in where it shouldn't be. Uh, absolutely. The church needs to get back to doing what the church is supposed to be doing. Living right, living for God, living sold out to Jesus. You know, living clean. Without holiness, no man shall see, see the Lord. <laughs> well, thank you. The, no, the, stop them the running too much. All right, now. 
Hallelujah. Go down to verse 23. Yeah. Now remember, uh, you know, there's promises made to Joseph and all kinds of stuff. We won't get into all that. But uh, the keeper of the prison looked, uh, looked uh, not to anything that was under his hand because the Lord was with him, Joseph. And that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. Again, that which he did. Did you notice Joseph has been laying around going, well, I'm just looking at the, you know, finished work of the covenant. Hallelujah. I don't have to do anything. It's going to happen no matter what I do. Because anything else is works. No, he did something. I said he did something. You know, whatever you do prospers. You know, the hand of the diligent. That's Old Testament. I don't give a rip where it is. It's Bible. Did you know Jesus said, I came not to undo the law, but to fulfill the law? Now, I, I, I know I'm going to digress, but just stay with me here. Uh, I'm going to digress to a different subject. You've got, you got homosexuals coming on all the time going, Jesus didn't say anything about homosexuality. Well, he didn't say anything about pedophilia either. And he didn't say anything about bestiality either. Now, did he? He didn't say anything about having seven wives. He didn't say anything about me. You couldn't marry your cat. Now, come on now. See, what we have to understand is Jesus only, for the most part, addressed the law when he was changing it. You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, love them that despitefully use you. Do good to them. See? He dealt with, he, he, when, he was, when he was saying there's a higher law, but the, he didn't just undo, he, he didn't come. And just because he didn't address certain things doesn't mean you don't do them. Mm -hmm. Or that they're not scriptural, they're not a principle of God. Yeah. Isn't that right? Yeah. So, you know, you can't, you can't look at what Jesus didn't teach on, and if he didn't teach on it, it means that it's okay. There's a lot of stuff Jesus didn't teach us. As a matter of fact, he, he, he confirmed the authority of the law as far as its moral standards, just that there was a higher law to operate on that from. But you still didn't just, you just couldn't go rampant and do whatever you wanted to do. You know, all of a sudden you can just go out and do anything you want to do. It don't matter anymore. That, what, what, that's not the truth. That's, that's, that, is, that is devilish interpretation of the word it's not even interpretation of the word they're not even interpreting anything that was said they're interpreting what wasn't said so let's let's stay with the word of god amen let's stay in in, in line with the word what joseph did prospered because of what he did in other words if he did nothing guess what it prospered in nothing now some of y'all remember the joel of prophet he would get on the radio back in the 60s and 70s. And he'd say, I need for you to send money today. And I know that some folks will send $10 and some folks will send $20 and some folks will send $5 and some folks will send nothing. And as the scripture saith, nothing from a nothing leaveth nothing. I heard him say it on the radio. Yep, nothing from nothing leaveth nothing. That's not what the Bible says. That's what Billy Stewart said, but, or not Billy Stewart, but uh, Billy. Nothing from nothing leaves nothing. What was his name? Anybody remember Billy something? Huh? No, no, no. It was, it was, it was a. No, 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 no. Oh, just. Billy Joe Bob? Thank God. <coughs> I couldn't get it. I couldn't figure out what it is now, no matter what. All right, go to Deuteronomy 29.9. So my point to all this, those, those little side journeys was this. There, is thing, there are things in the Bible, throughout the Bible, and most of the time in the Bible, God requires you to do something in order for other things to happen. And anybody that teaches you otherwise is teaching you a pie in the sky, a bunch of junk. Now, I'm not talking about doing it like a faith, and I'm not talk, talking about doing it in the energy of the flesh. But you still have a requirement to do things. God tells you to bring the tithe and offering into the storehouse. Uh -huh. 
Now, Paul wrote to the church at Corinth and said, he said, let every man give it as he purposes in his own heart, not begrudgingly nor of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Yeah. But then he also goes on and says in this, whole, pa this whole, pa whole passage, he says that, you know, be not deceived, God is not mocked whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. He also goes on and says, he that soweth sparingly mm -hmm. shall reap sparingly, and he that soweth bountifully yeah. shall reap bountifully. Yeah. Now, I don't know how you could get out of that, that no matter what you do, you're going to get. When, he, when Paul, the preacher of grace, said that you sow sparingly, you reap sparingly, you sow bountifully, you reap bountifully, and it's all according to how you purpose. Mm -hmm. That means you've got to do something to yeah. get the harvest. Get the sower, right. God gives seed to the sower. Can you imagine God giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, multiplies your seed sown, and some guy's laying on the front row looking, I'm looking at the finished work of Jesus with his seed in his hand and expecting a harvest. God multiplies the seed sown. He does not multiply the seed in the bag. Why? That violates his own laws and principles. Mm -hmm. Let every seed produce after its own kind. Yeah. Yeah. It's the law of Genesis. Yep. 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 I said that's the law of Genesis. That's the law of beginnings. That's the law of everything from the very beginning. Amen? All right. Back over here to Deuteronomy 29.9. Keep therefore the words of this covenant and do them, what? That ye may prosper in all that you do. <clears throat> so now when, we do, when, we, when we're sowing, when we're doing what God tells us to do financially, we're doing it in accordance with what he said to do. Amen. Now the book of Hebrews, and those things I'm not going to get to because they're not in my notes and I had no, no plan. And I know I'm going to spend here in the Old Testament. Understand this. The New Testament was built on the principles of the Old. The, the law was, did you understand this? God never intended to have to give the law. He made a covenant with Abraham and intended on bringing Jesus through Abraham, being nothing but promise, but even in that promise, Abraham paid tithes, the Melchizedek, the type of the, the coming Lord Jesus Christ. Having neither beginning or the end, the genealogy. In other words, he, was, he didn't have a genealogy, not that he was born supernaturally. They had no record of it so that he could be a type of Jesus. And that Abraham paid tithe to Melchizedek. And the Bible says that Jesus is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Tithing was a part of the promise. Mm -hmm. It was in the law because, they, you know, God, because God found out that people were hard-hearted and wouldn't listen. And so he gave them the law, not because they were, they were full of faith, it was because they were hard-hearted. But even in that, he, put, he instituted all the rules of tithing. But before that ever showed up, 400 years before the law ever got here, Abraham was tithing. And Levi paid tithe in the system of promise because he was in the loins of his father Abraham. Amen. So tithing is of the promise and not of the law. The law just added, added, added rules to, you know, how you had to do it, when it had to be done, and all that kind of stuff. But tithing was always, from the beginning, part of the promise. I'm not under the law. Good, you've got to tithe then. Because Abraham was a tither. And Abraham tithed the Melchizedek. Jesus is the priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And Hebrews says, there he received our tithe. <clears throat> didn't say received past tense, receiveth present tense. Anybody happy yet? Yeah. Anybody ready to shout yet? Come on now, shout, church. Yeah. See, we, we've got people teaching. I'm telling you people, there are people out there teaching the church how to get into financial bondage because they're lying to them. See, if you'll keep the covenant, Therefore, keep the words of this covenant and do them, then you'll prosper in whatever you do. See, God's got a promise to you of prosperity that if you'll follow his word and do what his word says, he's going to do stuff for you financially. Come on, say amen. But you've got people going around teaching you, you don't have to do that. Why? I'm going to say it's just doctrines of devils. It's designed of Satan to get you into the pattern of not obeying God in the words of his covenant 
so that when you have a financial need and you go to the field for your harvest, there's no harvest there because there's no seed there. And you can't have a harvest where there's no seed. God's law is that you give seed to the sower, bread to the eater, multiplies your seed sown and increases the fruits of your righteousness. We said this before, it's no new revelation here, but it was, it was a new revelation to me a few years ago, that the seed to the sower is for planting. Don't eat your seed. You heard preachers say, don't eat your seed. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Why? You grind up your seed and eat it, you won't have anything to plant. Right. If you don't have anything to plant, you're not going to get a harvest. Right. Right. Now, we got in our refrigerator, our freezer, actually, we, we freeze them. Just to, just to protect the longevity of them. Our collar seeds, and we grow a special kind of collar called a cabbage collar. Eastern Carolina, they crossbred them a number of years ago, and they're better. They're not as bitter. They're sweeter. You know, just, just a really good collar. And uh, so we freeze them. Now, if I take them up and make me collard seed pie, and if I got, we've got about 10,000 in a bag. I'm telling you, they just, they, when you, collard seeds are real tiny, and when, and when, they, hit, when they head up and, and flower up at, after, after the season and get the seeds in them, there's thousands of seeds so Janie's daddy had given us some. We have his, and then we planted just, just like 20 and gotten like 10,000 seeds out of the ones we planted. We got seeds forever, unless we eat the seed. Hello? Are you here? If I eat the seed, I get no harvest. But we planted them. We got, we got collar plants this year. We got about four or five heads. Like, they're, like, they're like this. Leaves on them like this. We're going to have collars for Thanksgiving. We love. Ba, 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 ba. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Going to get some fat meat with some salt and pepper on it. Hallelujah. Put it into the pot. Yeah. And let it boil all that flavor into the water. And then we're going to put the collars in the water. Ha! Ha! Make it shout. But if we don't, if we, if we took those seeds and somehow came up with a way to eat the seeds, pop collard seed muffins. We got poppy seed muffins, collard seed muffins, and ate up all our seed. We would, and, and then go out to the, go out there to where we want to plant them, and you know, and come Thanksgiving when we've been waiting all year to get good, to get them for to get really good and big and all that kind of stuff, and go out there and get some collards, and there's no collards out there. We can't get mad. We didn't plant, you don't plant the seeds, you don't get the collards. You got to plant the seeds. God wants us to, well, what is it? We do what he says do in accordance with his covenant. We walk in light of his covenant, and then God does exactly what he said he would do. But we've got teachers in the church, usually charlatans, because it's amazing how they're taking up offerings, teaching you not to tithe. Now, I'm going to be real ugly here. If you believe that God's going to cause you to prosper no matter what you do, stop receiving offerings. Yeah. Go hold your meetings and believe God that, you know, just, you, 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 don't, you just go preach and he's going, to get, he's going to pay for the building and he's going to do all that stuff and you don't need to take up an offering. Yeah. Now, they all take, teach everybody and then take up an offering. Because you're not doing works, you're, you're blessing their ministry to help other people understand anyway. Look, at, look over at Joshua 17, 1. We know a Joshua 1, 7 and 8 very well. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do. I, I, I meant Joshua 1, 7 and 8. I said 17. I know I got tongue tied there. Joshua 1, what happened was, I looked at my thing real quick, and I saw the 1, colon, 7, and left out the colon. Joshua 1, 7, only be strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do. Underline observe to do. See, we love this other part. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night. He said observe to do. Yeah. <laughs> now, do is a two-letter cuss word for some folks. It denotes required action on their part. Observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left. Why? That thou mayest prosper. Whithersoever thou goest. Now Joshua's being told here by God. Are you here? This is God talking to us. Mm -hmm. That don't turn away from the word. 
so that you'll prosper. You're to be a doer of the word. Now, when it comes to money, now that's uh, really, uh, you've got, you got to follow the word of God all the way through. In other, in other words, you can't be a good tither and an adulterer and expect it to work. Shoot me with your Nerf guns. Amen. You can't expect to be living in open sin. Now, let, let me say this. God loves you. God will forgive you of your sin. God has a plan of restoration for sin. But don't think you can live in blatant open sin and not bring repercussions into your life. Because when you begin to get into sin and not repent for it and keep living in it and be callous towards it, you begin to operate under the, the commands or the dictates of the law of sin and death. Now, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus may have made you free, but if you want to go get back in bondage, you can. God can deliver you from stuff, but if you go back into it, you can get right back into it. That won't ever be. Just grunt when I say stuff like that if you don't agree with me. Or if you do agree with me and just don't want to admit it, go ahead and grunt. No, he says that you may as deserve to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper, whether thou, so as thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then, in the Ed Taylor abridged version, it says, and only then, an unabridged version. I added the, and only then. Because that is the understood. When you observe to do according to what's written, then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and thou shalt have good success. Yep. Prospering and having good success came in relationship to what? Observing to do what was written. Okay. Are you here? Yeah. <clears throat> so for the church, the Word of God tells us in the, in the book of the prophet, Italian prophet Malachi. Okay. Malachi. But you know, we have, we have Italian. Anybody else Italian besides Karen? Well, we are, we, we are a little bit way, 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 way back. Yeah, we were. Music, huh? Yeah. <laughs> but because of the Italians, we, we like to pronounce the book of Malachi, uh, the prophet, Italian prophet Malachi. All right? But in Malachi, hallelujah, it says, Bring all the tithe and offering into the storehouse, and prove me now here, with, saith the Lord of hosts. So God says, bring it to... You know, John Morris was teaching here one time on that, on that passage, and he said the word prove in Hebrew means to do like a scientific experiment. You know, you take mixed baking soda and vinegar together, what happens? All right. All right, Abernathy, the younger Abernathy kids, y'all been y'all done the vinegar, baking soda thing in school, didn't you? Made the volcano. Put, and now they get real fancy. They put red dye in it. So when it comes up, it comes out red lava. She hadn't, they hadn't done that yet? Take her home and show her how to do it. I'll get your dad moving. <laughs> Bacon, soda, and vinegar going all over the kitchen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Uh, but prove like a scientific experiment. You put bacon, soda, and vinegar together, and you get a reaction. How do you know? Done it. All right. God said, prove me now herewith. Do it. He said, I'll open heaven's windows and pour out blessing on you. You won't have room enough to receive. Now, I'm going to say this. Everything we do, we're to do by faith. You tithe in faith. Mm -hmm. You tithe in faith believing. As a matter of fact, under the Old Covenant, when they brought the tithe to the storehouse, they were supposed to stand up and say, Now, Lord, hear from heaven. We've done what you told us according to your holy commandments. See, it was an act of faith. It was an act of faith. You have to tithe in faith. Believing what? That God will do exactly what he said he would do. He's going to have heaven's windows. <clears throat> you can't tithe and walk out. I ain't got no money. You tithe, tithe, when you tithe, you go out and say, I'm living under an open heaven. I'm living under an open heaven. How many tithers do I have in here? Yeah. Say it. I'm living under an open say what? I'm, open I'm doing what? I'm living, I'm living under an open heaven. What does that mean? Heaven's windows aren't shut up to me. God says he'll pour out. Now, the, the, the margin of that Malachi, <clears throat> where it says, I'll pour out a blessing on you, you won't have room enough to receive. The Hebrew actually says, empty out on you. God's not going to withhold any good thing from you. 
How shall he who spared not his own son, not also with him freely, give us all things? Now stop. Ah, oh, see, he's going to freely do it no matter what. He spared not his own son, but you still got to believe on him. Amen. You see, it's the, 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 the result of faith. Go through the Bible. You cannot get away from it. There are, there are acts of faith in response to everything God promises. There are things we're supposed to do. <coughs> Can you say amen? Owe me or help me, Jesus. Amen. 1 Kings 2, 3. And keep the charge of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and his testimonies. And as it is written in the law of Moses, what? That thou mayest prosper in all that thou doest and whithersoever thou turnest thyself. Second Chronicles twenty twenty. Believe in the Lord, the, the, the last part. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall you be established. Believe as prosper, prophets, so shall you prosper. We got a lot of people who, who are not prospering because they're not believing and adhering to the principles of, of, of honor, to men of God, to their pastors. And I'm going to tell you something. You watch it, it'll take you, it'll take you down a road. Do I need to throw a flag back there? I'm going to start bringing you. It's bad. It's well, Susan, I need to get me some yellow flags, penalties, and start throwing them in church. Yeah. Next, next uh, year, when, uh, probably at the wedding, I'm going to wear uh, umpire gear. That's called, called being honorary. Hallelujah. Second Chronicles uh, 26 5. Um, as he sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God, and as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. Now, you go seeking after yourself and your own selfish whatever. Now, I don't believe that. You're going to get it no matter what. Is that what James said? You have not because you ask not, or you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your own lust. That went ever big. You're going to get, you're going to get blessed no matter what. But what James said, you, ask, you have not because you ask not. Or, see, no, we mean not asking. See, you've got, you got two sides of it. You've got one side where people aren't asking because they're not getting in faith about it. Then you've got the greedy side who see, some, who see just a little bit of something and then begin going after it. Well, I'm going to get this and I'm going to get that. And it all becomes a miss. They lose the heart of prosperity from God. Yeah, yeah. And God's word says you have not because you ask not. Or... You ask amiss. What's the, what's, how's asking amiss? That you may consume it upon your own lust. Now, I'm going to tell you something. Dad Hagen, go get, I, I just encourage you, if you want to really balance whatever, just get the, book, the Midas touch. Hey, you know, King Midas was the, 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 the uh, mythological figure that everything he touched turned to gold. It's kind of hard to eat when everything he touched turns to gold. Isn't that right? But, uh, you know, he, he, told, he told guys, he said, look, you, you guys are teaching stuff that, we taught, that was taught in the 50s. It killed the move of God because you got an excess. You can't get an excess with any Bible subject. See, God wants us to prosper. But that doesn't mean that you've got to live with uh, whatever that guy's name was, Leach, something Leach. Robin Leach. Life, lifestyles of the rich and famous. You know? Got, got marble tile, they got, you know, Italian tile here in the foyer that's hand-carved 4,000 years ago. Cheerio, jolly good show, yes. On your yacht, $2 million yacht, parked in your private lagoon. Well, it's all cool stuff. But can I, can I ask y'all something? Now, I mean, I mean real, 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 real honest here. How many of us need private yachts? And I'm talking about, I'm talking about, uh, listen to me. Listen to me now. Take me where, take me where I am here. Two million dollar ocean faring yachts, three million dollar yachts that you're just, no. you're just going out and riding around on, just because you're, you know, and that's just so you could go ride when you got your summer home in, in, in the Caribbean and you got your winter home, uh, you know, in in, in South America. And, and, and in other words, I'm talking about this. You got your private jets. You got your private yachts. You got your private uh, buses. You know, we got millions and millions and millions of dollars. All so we can have stuff. 
Well, if that's your house, that's fine. I don't care. God doesn't care. But if, if everybody in the church has to have a yacht, if everybody in the church has to have a private plane, if everybody in the church has to have, no, let's just get out of the yachts and everybody, get down, there. everybody's got to have a Bentley or everybody's got to have a Porsche, everybody's got to have a Maserati. And we start preaching the excess that it's okay, that everybody should be getting that stuff. I don't, God doesn't care if you have it. He really doesn't. But if everybody in the church, look, how many people in this church right now? We've got probably, what, 30, 40 people here tonight. If every one of y'all spent $2 million on something private, That'd be $60 million. Now, can I ask y'all something? What could we do for the kingdom if everybody just spent a half a million dollars on something? Yeah. I, could, I could live with half a million dollars on something. Amen? We, we just have to be careful that we don't get caught. Uh, and you understand this. It's not a matter of God doesn't want you to have it and that's not right to have it. It is God is trying to make sure that we keep the right understanding that prosperity is about living comfortably. God wants you to live comfortable. God wants you to live comfortable. He doesn't want you living in a rat's nest. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to get on the other side of the ditch. You can't have anything. You know? I mean, as long as, long as you know, you can, you can keep the rain off of you with the tarp over your bed while you're sleeping at night, that's good enough. That, that's not what God's after. Mm -hmm. But he's not for gold leaf shingles either. See, I've been to Thailand, and the, and the Buddhist temples are covered in gold leaf. They took up an offering for the king because he's a deity. The year I was there, $50 million. And you ride down the road out in the country, and there'll be this huge mansion with 10-foot brick walls all the way around the whole mansion, and next to it is a ditch, drainage ditch, and a guy living in a hut made out of Pepsi crates, adjacent to his wall. Well, you got, you got the two extremes right there. God don't. God really not looking. He got a mansion coming in heaven, folks. There's a job to win people to Jesus. I, I said I used the, the yacht thing because because Leach was always on somebody's yacht and pumping that lifestyle. You know, how, how many have ever gone seen yachts like that? I think I've been to uh, been to Nassau. You get out and um, you know over Atlantis, and you go down the uh, after eat, you go down to the docks there, and there are like three story yachts and. I mean, they're 80 foot long, and I mean, they're like $20 million yachts. Not two, just $20 million yachts. They're, huh? You have palm trees on them. I mean, $20 million yachts sitting there. And, it's, you know, and, and this, just, just to kind of come back on this side of it, not that having that's wrong. I mean, if you're making $300 million a year, and you're giving... A, Seventy million dollars to the gospel. You have a twenty million dollar God. It's not going to be a big deal. I'm just saying we need to make sure we don't get so caught up in life yeah. about possessing what the rich have that we forget about why God, God wants us to prosper. And and, and I know I'm, I'm going back door into this. So much of what we did in teaching on prosperity was to teach you can have what the rich people have. Really. That was our hook. And so our pastor started wearing prosperity clothes and driving prosperity cars and wearing power ties and had to have hand-tailored suits and hand-tailored you know, shoes made by cobblers and, and all this kind of stuff. Now, I'll be honest with you. If you gave me $5,000 and said, Pastor, I want you to go get a hand-tailored suit, I wouldn't do it. You know why? Because I would probably spill something on it the first time I wore it out in public. And it would, be, it would be useless for me to spend, you know, to have a $5,000 hand-tailored suit unless it was dipped in Scotch guard. <laughs> and I came walking in like this. You know, I, I don't, <laughs> I don't need a, a $25,000 presidential Rolex on my arm. Why? Because I go through door jams all the time and hit the crystal and bang it up. And besides... I could wear a $500 watch and spend, you know, 24500 on something a whole lot better. Now, I know I've got myself over here in deep water. <laughs> with the yacht. Again, yeah, God doesn't care. Right. Yeah. Okay, you know, God, you know, I have dream cars. Sure. Everybody has dream cars. Yeah. Would I like to have a private jet sitting outside taking me where I want to go? Oh, that'd be cool. Honestly. That would be cool. I went, 
when, when uh, Dr. Thompson came here, we went to the airport and got on his jet and sat there. That's cool. Didn't get to fly. Got to sit on it. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, but you know what? There's a lot to do for the kingdom. And so I think we need to get away from the hooks. Uh -huh. That's what I really have to get away from the hooks to get people to give and they're going to get rich by doing this. They're going to get all this stuff and get our hearts where we set our affections on things above. And now I think it's okay to want to have good things. But let it not become an inordinate <sighs> lust or an overbearing lust to where it controls your life. Yeah. <clears throat> I know people right now who, mm -mm -mm, Lord, help me say this without getting myself in trouble. They want to be able to sell everything they got and just go live like a free bird all over the country, have no connections, no, no whatever. God doesn't, they, they, they've told me more than once, I can make six figures if I wanted to. Then why don't you? Why don't you go make six figures a year and give to God? Because I'm going to tell you something, the free bird lifestyle is not going to satisfy anything you want. Go give it to God. Just go give it to God. Let your spouse make money and support you, and you just go make money and give it to God. But what, 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 what could you do with giving 100000 150000 a year to God? And you're still living good. See, we, we, get, we get these wrong ideas about what God... God has a purpose for you. Does God buy if you ride around the Caribbean for a couple weeks? No. Does he care if you, all you're doing is riding around the Caribbean and doing nothing but ride around the Caribbean? Yep. He didn't call us for that. We're called to greater than that. Could I hang out in the Caribbean? You got that right, baby. I like snorkeling with the fishies. Now, not the fishies that hurt you, but the fishies, I like it. See, I, I remember the first time I ever went snorkel was in, in, in uh, Dominican Republic. And it was beautiful, beautiful. We're out on a little reef. The currents were pretty bad, but, but the most beautiful tropical fish you'll ever see. Now, I, we've, cooked, we've done a lot up in the Bahamas, but I'm going to tell you, that down there in Dominican was, the, was way prettier. I mean, I saw all, all those fish you see when you go to the saltwater aquariums and places, they were there. The little East Carolina fish, that's purple and gold fish. We, I, just, I don't know whether they're, they're East Carolina fish. Why right, the purple and gold? Now, I know Louisiana State or whatever, LSU, Texas. Nah, we were there. Anyway, we claim it. It's East Carolina fish. Boy, I just went out here and waited out there and just went bloop. Because God wants us to understand that prosperity cannot be about asking a mist that we can consume it on lust. Now let me say something. If you can judge your heart and find out that it's not being consumed on lust, that it's a... Understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. No, no, I'm right. If you judge your heart, yeah. then you can go ahead. Mm -hmm. Amen. I sat on something. You know what? Now, how I many y'all y'all heard me say for years, I like a Z3. Yeah. I like... No, actually, the Z4 I like a little bit better because it's a little bit bigger. The cockpit's a little bit bigger. That would be better for me. I like two-seat convertibles. That's the bottom. I like a two-seat convertible. Had one when Jamie and I were dating. I had a little Fiat 124 Spider, and a British racing green with a tan top. Five on the floor, real wood on the dash. Sold that so I could go to Bible school. Always want. Well, see, actually, I sold it when I, bought, when I got my job and bought a brand-new Spider 2000, 1979, right from the factory. It had 63 miles on it when I got it. And uh, actually, 600. They, it was down in Wilmington. They had to go down to Wilmington and drive it back, and they had been driving around a little bit down in Wilmington. But it had just come off the ship like two weeks before from, from Italy. And I sold my Fiat Spider and got me the demon car to go to Rama. <laughs> demon car? A gremlin. An AMC gremlin. Go look up gremlin in the dictionary. Synonym, synonym, synonym? Demons. And I had demons. So, demon car, demon car. Demon car, demon car. I had little demons all over it. I love little things. You know, but you know what? There's just been times, it's just been as, as, as nice. It's one of those things, you know, that's a luxury that I, I like to have, but I'm not going to do it unless I'm in a position that it's not going to hurt how I give, how I serve God, how, you know what I'm saying? And if we would spend more of this time in church, we wouldn't be manipulated as easy when some preacher says, I got a thousand fold anointing tonight, and you're going to be debt free tomorrow. Just give me a, and people writing thousand and ten thousand dollar checks. Because what happens to that money is it never makes it 
to the local church where the job is being done. And I'm going to tell you something. If you'll learn to give and to serve God, I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to kind of wrap this up right in here. If you learn to sow and to give to the church and do what God says, God will give you the desires of your heart. And he'll, he'll let you have the yacht or the car in due season and due time. Because if you, he knows that you'll take care of his stuff, he'll take care of yours. <laughs> but you can't, listen, you can't come at it from that approach. If I give this, I'm going to get the yacht. I was trying to say, what I'm trying to say is, there's a desire in your heart, God will get to you. Now, if your desire is, I'm going to give so I can get the desire of my heart, you, that's the wrong thing. And that's what we've got to be, we be careful about and keeping our hearts humble before the Lord Amen. and keeping a pure heart and keeping pure motives and how we do things. Mm -hmm. We've got to judge ourselves. Mm -hmm. yes. We have to judge our motives. Mm -hmm. Folks, this is why the charismatic Word of Faith Church is the most gullible bunch on the planet when it comes to certain doctrines. They'll come in and preach, if you give to this, and you do this, you're going to have this much money, and they'll throw in it so you can give to the kingdom. But every last person sitting out there is chinging up so they can get that thing they want. And then they take out the offering, everybody's running out there because they're expecting to have enough money to get this, 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 and this for the next six months. Give me a Jesse Duplantis, guys. If we would learn to give because we love God, if we would learn to obey his laws because we love God, if we would learn to tithe because we love the work of God and we won't meet in the house, if we put God, for, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself, when we put God first, and the motive behind what we do is God first, you really don't have to be real concerned about all the other stuff. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Amen. I'm going to stand and tell you right now, if you give this week, you're going to have a debt cancellation next week and a, and a Mercedes the following. How about if we could learn just to give to God because we love him. And say, Lord, here it is because I love you. Keep your heart pure. Now, how do I keep my heart pure? Then when you catch the first inkling of the wrong motive, you jump on it. Now, now let me share something with you. I'm going to cl close with this. This is closing number two. Of... Probably seven or eight. But anyway, Dad Hagen, years, a few years before he ever um, put his teachings in the book form, or, or, or actually not book form, but um, recorded form. Look, look. See, he'd been recording, he'd record them on the old reel to reels. Somebody sit out there with an old reel to reel. Anybody ever seen an old, like, portable reel to reel? Huh? Yeah, portable. It's kind of like the old luggable PCs, 70 pounds, which are in the Smithsonian, by the way. Janie used to lug one home from work. Yeah. Lug, they called them a luggable. They didn't call them portable. They called them luggables. Why? Because you had to lug that sucker home. Anyway, the Lord told, started talking to him about putting his, his stuff into book form. And he was praying about it and getting ready to, and getting ready to start. And three men came to him. He said, Brother Hagen, we want to... We wanna, we want to fund you putting your, book, your tapes in the book form. See, and they said, one of them said this, you can make a lot of money. He shut it down for three years and wouldn't do what God said do because he had to make sure his heart was right when he did do it so that it was not, it wasn't about the money, it was about getting the gospel out. Three years. He didn't print the books. Because he had to make sure his heart was right. They planted that seed and he could not move until that was completely out of his system. 
And then you have people come, ah, oh, you got to do it, brother. You know, God wants you to be blessed. God wants you to have your book so you can get blessed. <clears throat> Hello? And now I've heard people preach. You know, I believe in God for a one-time gift of $25,000. Me personally, da 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 They heard Dad preaching that. But you know what you hear? That you don't, that Dad said, I've heard Dad say it too. But you know what he said on the end of it? He said, what am I going to do with that money? I'm going to tell you what we're going to do with that money. We're going to put it right back into the work of the ministry. We're going to print more books. We're going to make more tapes. We're going to support more works of God around the world. See, it wasn't about him getting it. It was about getting the word out. Now, seek ye first the kingdom of God, his righteousness. Remember what he said about this? What did he say? He talked about all the things that people want. He said, after all these things, do the Gentiles seek. Not that having the yacht or the car or the bus or the plane is wrong, but that's what the Gentiles seek after. They want that status. We have to come to a place where we're emptied of that. And then if it's a desire of our heart, it's not because we're trying to be like that. We've been seeking God's kingdom. We've been seeking God. We want God advanced. Mm -hmm.